Good morning, people of grace. Thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, today we are in a, uh, a very interesting passage, Matthew 26, 47 through 56, specifically talking about Jesus' arrest, and it kind of sandwiches in, or it is a bookmark to, or not a bookmark, I guess it's a, um, it's a, it's a next chapter in um, Jesus being led to the cross and ultimately dying on the cross for us. So it's important for us to learn today and to, to study and to understand what, um, what, we, what God has for us. But before we do that, let's pray and uh, we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you so much for uh, just your great love that you've shown to us. We thank you for what your son has done, becoming a man, being born of a virgin, Lord, and living a perfect life. And and ultimately, Lord, um, being punished and killed for our sins. And Lord, we are thankful for that. We know that there was a great cost for that. And we pray that we would uh, recognize that and we would live that. And I ask that you would change us to be more like your son because of what we learned today and what we will continue to learn throughout this week. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Like I said, we're in Matthew 26, 47 through 46. We'll just start. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Jesus said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of, the, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in place, Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you, didn't do, you did not arrest me. But this has, has all taken place that the writing of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And to kind of build on what I was trying to say in the beginning is to these verses really tie in or are part of the immediate passages before that, that Sam taught on yesterday, uh, the prayer in Gethsemane where Jesus was praying in the garden. So imagine, if you will, um, Jesus is in the middle of, just gets done rebuking his disciples for falling asleep because he asked them to pray and, and they didn't pray and they didn't stay watch. And he, and he says this, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of the sinner. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. And then we get right into this passage. So it's it's not like, I know that uh, in your Bible it's broken down into passage. You may read them that way, but they really do go together. And here, here we see, Judas leading this large army of men to capture Jesus. I, I find it, I find it really interesting that there were so many people there to make sure Jesus didn't escape. Uh, you know, the religious leaders of uh, of the Jews at that time they didn't want to take any chances. They hated Jesus, and they just didn't want him to 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 escape or or them to have been mistaken and grab the wrong person. And that's why they, they actually paid Judas so much for literally all he had to do was simple, uh, identify Jesus. And, um, and then they would arrest him. But the funny thing is about all this is that, it, it's, I guess it's not funny, but it's sad. It, it, if Jesus really wanted to be uh, not to be found or to just disappear, he literally could, and we've seen that in other passages like John eight fifty nine, where the crowd was uh, the 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 probably these same people. I don't know. They were questioning Jesus about what authority do you have of casting out the demons, and he answered with you know what he answered with such a powerful way that it just it angered the crowd um, so much that they wanted to pick up the stone to kill Jesus. 
But as you know, that was not the time or the place where Jesus was to die. So he literally just slipped away and disappeared. And I'll read that for you just as a reminder in John 8, 59. I'm going to read in verse 58 first, and then I'll finish in 59. So John 8, 58 says, Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. At this point, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus he hid himself. He slipped away from the temple grounds. I, I love that passage of John so much. Before Abraham was born, I am. And if there was any question in anyone's mind what Jesus was here for, there is absolutely no deniability right now. He was claiming to be the God, and he was. And, and I just love that, that you see, uh, I don't know how much time passed, but Obviously, they saw Jesus and they surrounded him, but what happened? He disappeared. He slipped away. That's, that's pretty amazing. So back to our passage here in Matthew. My point is I'm trying to remind us and try to have us remember um, that uh, the Jesus did this. Jesus um, remind that that I'm losing my train of thought here. Uh, my point in reminding us about what Jesus did here earlier in John is that if Jesus wanted to be found or disap- didn't want to be found or to, to disappear, he literally could have. But as I mentioned before, the time had not come for him to do that, and that that time for Jesus to be taken away and to be killed on the cross was now. So next we see in the story this terrible thing where Judas is leading this crowd and he uh, he comes and he and he tells the, the leaders that he would point it that, that the person that he kisses is the one that uh, is Jesus. So what does Judas do? He comes to Jesus, he kisses him on the cheek, and he says, "Greetings, Rabbi." And man, if you <laughs> You know, I, I'm sure that after the disciples saw what he did, uh, they, probably, they probably wanted to cut his head off. But I want to point out a couple of interesting facts that, that I read in a commentary. That the, Jewish, the ancient Jewish traditions pointed this out. First thing is, is if a student of a rabbi ran into his rabbi, the tradition was to wait for the rabbi to speak to the student first before the student would even say anything. What did Judas do? He went up to Jesus first, and he said, uh, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. So he, he broke that tradition. Second, Judas acted as if he didn't care for Jesus, as if he cared for Jesus by, by what? By kissing him on the cheek. It's something you would do uh, for uh, someone that you love. But it was the opposite. It was, it was the sign of a betrayal. It was, as some say, the kiss of death. And sad thing is, is that Judas was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of Jesus' closest friends. Think of all the people that, that followed Jesus on a regular basis They everywhere he went because Jesus' fame towards the end of his life, he was really popular. People, he was doing amazing things, and people saw that. Not only healing people, but he was saving people. And there were many people to follow him. And those 12 were the ones that were with Jesus everywhere they went. And Judas was one of those. And certainly, I don't want us to think that it was, it, it took uh, Jesus by surprise. Jesus knew who Judas was when he chose Judas. He knew that he would be the betrayer. But he did it anyway because Scripture had to be fulfilled. And I'm sure it was still painful for Jesus, who, who probably gave Judas so many things, to see Judas betray him in such a vile and disgusting way. And it was sad, and it it's really is sad. And then we see, next we see in the stories that Jesus responds to this kiss, and I think this is kind of interesting. It's, you know, he, call, he, he called him his friend. Jesus called him his friend. And don't be fooled just because Jesus called him his friend. He, he knew who Judas, Judas was. He knew what Judas was doing there. Jesus called Judas a friend was probably most likely like a, a play on what Judas did by calling Jesus his rabbi or teacher. There's some sort of ir- irony there. And I love this next part. And, and I would like to, to have us um, 
to 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 have us to think about what what we've done when when we see a disciple uh when we this next part we see this disciple taking out the sword and 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 just aims and swings the sword and cuts cuts the ear of this high priest's servants I think a couple things that I'd like to know. It's it's a great story. First, Matthew doesn't tell us who the disciple is, but um, thankfully in John 18 we know it was Peter. So it's Peter who took this sword and 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 cut off this uh, high priest's uh, ear. Secondly, that's interesting, and you've probably heard this, but I love this. Peter was probably most likely aiming for the high priest's head, and I don't know how it all happened, but somehow he missed and. You know, if you if you know where a head is, the head is here, and somehow he hit here. I, I don't know. Maybe the maybe the high priest stood in front of him this, to protect his uh, his his master. I, I don't know. Um, but don't you just love Peter? Um, I, I can just imagine Peter. You know, he'd be one of those guys that were just like, you know, just full of energy and just ready to take on the world. But you know, I think about it. Uh, Judas brought with him all this 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 army of men to take jesus down and peter was the only one that was ready to fight he was the he was ready to take on this this huge army and and we have to remember where did peter come from was he a, was he a soldier he wasn't he was a fisherman but peter knew that is if he was with jesus i don't know if he thought this or it was just just his instinct of this is the way he responded but in some way, Jesus knew that he was with Jesus and that he didn't have to fear. And even trained soldiers, I'm sure Jesus, he, Peter thought that they could take him. So Peter did what come natural. He didn't even hesitate. He was ready to fight. But Jesus rebuked Peter and, and he told him to put his sword away. And, and he reminded him and everyone that was there that that if, if they wanted to, if Jesus wanted, he literally could have called to his father and had 12,000 legions of angels instantly descend upon these men, which we know would lead to their demise. And as a side note, I looked up what a legion is. Maybe you already know this, but a legion is four to 6,000 men. So you've, you've got four to 6,000 times 12 men. And I'm sure that a single angel could completely destroy all these men. But Jesus was pointing out that he had the power to instantly call to his heavenly father an army that would just decimate any earthly army. There was no match against Jesus' army and Jesus. Jesus further you know, goes on by saying that scripture must be fulfilled. And this is an important part. And this is something that, that had to happen. Um, and it's comforting. It's a comforting thing for us to hear as followers of Christ. When God makes us a promise when jesus promises he will do something when he says something in eternity past we are confident and we should find comfort to know that god will fulfill it no matter what even even to the pain and misery of what jesus went through um and that is amazing before he's, jesus was taken away jesus questioned the religious leaders and he said Am I leading a rebellion that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I, I, I sat in the temple court teaching and you didn't you did not arrest me. Why didn't they arrest Jesus before? I think the answer is because they didn't answer him because scripture needed to be fulfilled. Psalms 22, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 12 and, thir- 12 and 13. Scripture had to be fulfilled the way that it, pl- uh, that it, pl- that it happened. And uh, no, no man could change that, even Satan. And finally, once, once again, uh, we see Scripture at the very end, that Scripture being fulfilled, that the disciples, they scattered. And just a few verses ago, Jesus told them that this would happen. Jesus said to his own disciples, This very night you will all fall away in an account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Isn't it literally amazing how quickly the disciples forgot? How, I mean, it couldn't have been that long after Jesus said that. But they got caught up in, in what was happening, and they, and they were scared, I think. And, and they scattered. 
just as Scripture said. So this is an amazing part to an amazing story. It's not the end. Um, there's, there's so much more to come. Uh, and I'm thankful that we can just spend just a few short minutes talking about uh, how Jesus was arrested. But I want us to walk away with uh, two things that we can learn today. And I always want to walk away with the last thing. I always finish this way, but I think there's two things here. First is that we should find comfort in knowing that God always keeps his promises. He never lies. He will always fulfill what he has said in the past. And you may ask, well, why is that so comforting? Why should that be so comforting? Because there's no one that you know is that, that faithful, not even close to that. The more and more we dig into Scripture and find his promises, we need to cling to those. Because we're going we're gonna to be faced with uh, Satan who comes to us and uh, he tempts us to, to fall away. Little here, little there, little this, little that. But Scripture, we can lead, we can find confidence in knowing that God's promises will always come about. What He promised us will never fail. It's as good as anything. It's good as anything that is permanent. It's permanent, permanent. And the second thing is, we need to praise Jesus for being submissive to the Father and and for humbling Himself. Coming down to this earth as as a man, being born of a man, he was God. He didn't need to become a man, but he did that for us. And he was obedient even unto death. Jesus knew what was going to happen, but yet he still came here to earth. He still allowed these men to pick him up and take him and let him be beaten and whipped and ultimately killed for us. That is an amazing God. We should praise him for that, and let's do that right now. Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for what he has done and and uh, just the great testimony he's been and the great witnesses he's been for us on how to, how to love others, how to serve others, uh, how to give to others, and how to be obedient to you fully. Lord, we fail you every single day. Uh, we don't deserve your love. We don't deserve your mercy that you you shower on us each day. Father, forgive us where we fail you. We, f- we fail you so much, Lord. But I ask, Lord, that you would just help us to, to live our lives daily, moment by moment, trusting you. Lord, we need you in our lives, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, people of grace, thank you so much for joining me again this morning. Look forward to uh, continuing th- teaching through the book of Matthew. Uh, We'll be finishing up shortly. Have a good one.